Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Pat, uh, for comments around supper this morning. We do have visitors, a member of visitors this morning. We're so thankful that you're here. We hope you have already experienced the spiritual freshness by being here this morning. And we hope at some point, those of you that have every opportunity to come back and be with us again, we hope at some point you'll transition from being a visitor to actually being a member of this church family. If you have any questions about anything we have done today or are going to do today or anything that I might say, or if you have questions from the Scripture, I want to make myself available to you, so just let me know and I'll be happy to try to open the, the Bible and we'll try to answer any questions you might have. This morning... We find ourselves in the third message of what I plan to have, uh, be in a series of four messages. I've been preaching about one message a month that coincides with our goal here this year, one of the goals that we have as a congregation, uh, to install, appoint elders in this congregation. And so we're working towards that goal, and I plan to bring one more lesson, specifically one more lesson, uh, on this particular subject. And in that final lesson, uh, I'm going to zero in on a couple passages, two primary passages, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and Titus chapter 1, 6 through 9. And we're going to look specifically at these qualities, work qualities. I'm going to point those out that we need of the men who will serve as elders. I'm going to point out the importance of the community qualities, the character qualities, and the family qualities that are very important by God's design for the men who will serve as elders in this congregation. Elders, sometimes termed in the scriptures as shepherds, elders, shepherds, is the same office or work of ministry in the local congregation. We've already noted together that eldering is about shepherding, and shepherding is about the sheep. We are all sheep in God's flock. And God has called elders to watch over the flock in care and concern for each member. God has called elders to equip members of the body of Christ and to encourage body, members of the body of Christ to do the work of ministry as we are to be faithful to God in whatever ways of which we can, wherever God has blessed us and whatever we can do with what God has blessed us, talents, abilities, and so forth, to His glory. So this morning, I did all that to say this. This is sort of a generic kind of lesson, but it's an important lesson as we prepare to zero in next month on these two passages, 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1. The question that I begin with today is how awake are you spiritually? It's a good reflective question. How awake are you spiritually? God has already given us the greatest wake-up call that we could ever find in Scripture, and that is Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. We know it is the cost of the blood of Christ that frees us from our sins. It is the most expensive wake-up call that we could ever have, and we need to be growing in our commitment to God. And if we are going to grow, we can't hit the snooze button. Right? In fact, there is no snooze button for anyone. No elders, there's no snooze button for elders. But there's no snooze button for members either. We all have a responsibility in the church family. Jesus came to give Israel a wake-up call. For the most part, Israel didn't accept the wake-up call. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and those that thought they were the religious elite, even by the common people of the day, they, he rebuked them in this way. They could read the signs of the weather, he said, but they couldn't read the signs of the time. And the time was the Messiah had come. Spiritually speaking, it was a time of the Messiah, and they had failed to heed his wake-up call. And there are a number of wake-up calls in the Scripture. As you read through, you would recognize these kinds of verses. For example, Romans 13 and verse 11 the latter part says, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He is trying to wake up believers that are... Hey, look, Satan is always trying to get us to kind of drift off to sleep, to drift away from where we need to be. And so he's trying to wake up and make sure that they're going to be alert 
They're going to be on their guard. Those are kinds of uh, uh, words that are used in the Scripture. Uh, to be self-controlled and alert, for example, 1 Peter chapter 5, against Satan's schemes. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse uh, 17, we have to be awake to our personal responsibility as members in the body of Christ, the church family. Scripture says in Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders. He's talking about spiritual leaders. Elders are spiritual leaders. They are leaders, but don't miss that spiritual part because that's important. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. That's pretty so sobering. They are going to give an account unto God for the way in which they watch over and care for the members. Obey them, the Scripture says, so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would not be of any advantage to you. So while elders exist for the benefit of the church family, we as a church family have a responsibility to encourage the men we put in as our spiritual leaders. And to do that, we need to be spiritually awake. We need to be sure that we are spiritually awake so that we can be a support and help to the men who will be leading us as elders. When the, Jesus needs us the most, are we asleep? When we should be praying, are we sleeping? When we should be serving, have we turned off our spiritual alarm clock? In the first part of Acts chapter 20, verse 7, the church came together for the purpose of breaking the bread and communing with the Lord. That first day of the week, they come together. It is Sunday. It is the Lord's Day. It is the Resurrection Day. For the primary purpose they come together is to break the bread. The Lord's Supper is in mind here in Acts 20, verse 7. And in the original language, it's really, really clear because it is the context tells us what it is, I think, right here without the Greek. But in the Greek, literally it says, the breaking, article, the breaking of the bread. It's a specific bread. It's not a common meal. Now, there's a common meal in the context, but it's not here. So they came together to break bread together. The Lord's Supper was extremely important, still is, to the spiritual alertness and awareness of Christians. Acts 20 verse 7 goes on to say, Paul spoke to the people, Paul the Apostle, spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. Paul preached longer than I'm going to preach today. That's, I know that's good news for you. Let me tell you how long Paul preached. He preached on and on. The King James says he preached long. He was long preaching. Now, he's doing that for a couple of reasons, I'm sure. He is closing up. He's finalizing on the last part of his third missionary journey, his last missionary journey. And he knows that he's not going to see these people again, likely on this side of heaven. And he wants to pour into them everything he can, and understandably so. And they want to hear everything the apostle has to say. So hey, they have gathered, and they are there on that first day, planning to be there on that first day. And he preaches on and on. And when a preacher preaches on and on, we might not be surprised that someone somewhere might fall asleep. And in this case, someone does fall asleep. The Bible tells us Eutychus fell asleep. Verse 9. And by the way, in verse 8, uh, Luke, who is writing Acts by inspiration, gives us a little bit of the scene. The scene is, he says there in verse 8, there are many lamps in the room. It's an upstairs room where they're meeting. 
In verse 9, seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. He wasn't just going to sleep on the surface. He's going into deep sleep. And to make that point, Luke goes on to say, as Paul talked on and on, when this man was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul immediately stops preaching. Obvious reasons. All of a sudden, Paul's theology moved from a, from a real life drama. And, and what's interesting is I look in the, the Acts 27 passage, I don't see any rebuke towards Eutychus for falling asleep. Maybe he had been sick. Maybe he had worked all night the night before and all day. Whatever reason. I believe he's there. We have no reason to think he's not, to hear the Apostle Paul and his words. And for whatever reason, he falls asleep. He fell asleep during the sermon. Now, I think what happened to him probably, probably kept anyone else from ever falling asleep in a sermon again. <laughs> but this man, young man, dozes off. I've seen some strange things in church buildings, in church assemblies. I, I have over the years. I have seen animals that should stay outside come inside. I have seen certain things that can cause a ruckus during a sermon. I've seen, I've seen little critters from the pulpit that would run from here to there, and I'm wondering, what do I do? Because there's ladies out there that don't want to see that good. I've seen little children get away from their parents and make their way up to the preacher, calling up to the preacher. And, and that's never bothered me, by the way. But it changes the flow of the sermon. I've heard sounds of thunder and hail so loud that it makes it hard to preach and even harder to hear on the roof. I've seen squirrels that have tried to take up residence in church buildings. I've seen secretaries and preachers chasing squirrels down the hall. You should have seen the, you should have seen the face of the secretary. I said, you stand down there and I'll run the squirrel down your way. <laughs> and with the broom, steer him into, the, steer him into this room. And that wasn't on the, uh, what do you call that, the job... <laughs> requirements. I've seen a lot of things, but I've never seen anything that took place like it does here in Acts 20. Eutychus literally fell asleep and fell out of a three-story window. And again, I don't believe it was the young man's intention to fall asleep, and I'll tell you why. If he had intention to fall asleep, he wouldn't pick an open window on the third floor to sit in. Sermon nappers don't do that. Now, the most unusual circumstance, and it was, because the young man falls and he, he's dead. This unusual circumstance gives Paul an opportunity to demonstrate the power of God. Verse 10, Acts 20. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, put his arm around him, don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. And then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. This is, this is the common meal. After talking until midnight, uh, until daylight he left, the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So, go back up to the room. Paul eats a little bit. They have a little fellowship meal. And he continues to talk. And I wonder what they talked about. Because we're not told. But don't you, don't you think that it's possible they talked about the power of God? Here is God bringing life to someone before their eyes that was dead. I think it came up. I think the writer of Acts wants us to see the power of God. He certainly does in many places in the Scripture. 
Think about this. When we understand the power of God, it should, it should keep us awake when we should be awake. How awake are you spiritually? I don't know if you ever thought about it. I suspect you have. But I believe Satan is a spiritual anesthesiologist. You know, when you have surgery and the anesthesiologist comes in, they give you some medicine that helps you go to sleep and not surface sleep. Sound sleep. Deep sleep. And when you are sound asleep, somebody can come into your room and they can push you, give you a little shot, and you won't wake up. Because you are asleep. I think that Hebrews chapter 2 says this, for our one, we must pay careful attention to the Word of God lest we drift away. We don't want to drift away from the Word that brings life. All of us have been in a room at one time or another probably and have fallen asleep while there are things going on in the other room and because we were asleep, we didn't know what all was going on in the other room. When we go to sleep, we're often unaware of what's happening around us. But I suggest we also are unaware sometimes of what's happening to us. When our children were small, we went camping a number of times. And I remember one time we went camping in the, in the middle of summer. It was hot. And it was humid where we were. But we went camping. The children wanted to go camping, and we made it a point to go. And we get out to the lake, and we set up the tent. And we had a band at the time. We uh, had a fire. We cooked supper and roasted marshmallows. We did not need a fire to keep us warm. It was hot. Well, some of us slept in the van. Some of us slept in the tent. Partly in the van because of the noises that some of the, the, the kids heard. And my wife and I tossed and turned. It's hard to sleep when it's that hot. We tossed and turned as long as we could, and, and we kind of got up and we talked to each other and we, we made a plan. Let's get out of this camping zone. Get back to the air conditioner. And so we broke camp as quietly as we could. And, and, and we got our children into the van and, and we broke down camp and, and we turned on the, the van and the air conditioner that we longed for. And we made our way back home. Very carefully take the children into their beds and put them in their beds. And the next morning they wonder, where, why were they not at the camp? Why were they not at the lake? I figured out, that's one of the advantages of being married. Wife could tell them that. <laughs> That was the wife's job on that occasion. It was an interesting conversation, but the point is this. When we are asleep, we are unaware of what's happening to us sometimes. And it's a wake-up call for us who are Christians. Elders and members alike. Sitting in the church building with our eyes open does not mean that we are awake spiritually. It does not mean that we are getting the message that God wants us to get. Remember the contents of Acts 20. The church came together to partake of the Lord's Supper in addition to hearing Paul speak. And I suggest that our spiritual alertness is related to our desire to be with God's people on the first day of the week to worship the Lord and partake of the Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 reads, Therefore, whoever eats his bread and drinks his cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
And then notice verse 30. That is why many among you, church of Corinth, are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Our attitude towards the Lord's Supper is a vital sign of our spiritual alertness. So I ask the question, what else can we do, or what can we do, to wake a person up to the fact that Jesus is the Christ? We can remind them, we can remember for ourselves, and remind them or communicate to them, there will be a day that every knee will bow, and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord. And because of that, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, that now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. Don't procrastinate. We can remind them and us how fragile life is. And that we're not promised tomorrow. James 4 verse 14 says, Life is but a mist of vapor that appears for a little while and it vanishes away. I did... Well, let me say it this way. When I think about the fragileness of life, I think about hundreds of memorials that I've been able to do, celebrations, I guess, of life or families. Hundreds. I think about individuals, faithful people, for the most part, very faithful from my perspective. They went to, to be with the Lord, some very early, very, very early in life. You see, young people don't think young people die. That's not true. Young people do die. I did a memorial for a, a very young child, but probably early 16, 17 years old, riding their bicycle to work in the right place at the right time, but unfortunately the wrong time for someone who is driving drunk. You see, not everybody that dies are laying in hospital beds in the ICU wing. People die sitting on their couch, watching television, or driving their automobile. We all have known people who were in great shape, ate right, <coughs> took their vitamins, you still suffer a heart attack and die. I guess all that, from all that, we ought to know, at least from the Scriptures, that we ought to be right with God today and not put it off till to tomorrow. We need to remember there's only one safe place to die, and really that safe place is in the Lord Jesus Christ. What else can we do to help someone stay awake and us keep ourselves awake? We can remind them what the Lord has done so heaven can be our home. In Romans 8, verse 37, the Apostle declares, We are more than conquerors. Really? Yes, we are. Through Christ, who loves us. Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor present nor power, nor height nor depth, nor anything else, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Speaking of my article, that Jerry alluded to. I love the phrase, the promise of life. I love that phrase. It is found in the King James Version, the New King James Version, the English Standard Version, the New International Version, and the New American Standard Version. I, I didn't look further than that. The promise of life. Paul says... I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus. By the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. I love that phrase. I love what it means. I love what it stands for. And it means that we can excuse ourselves as God's people from the frowning world around us. And the promise of life will cause a sleeping Christian to wake up. I mean, if, if by chance, a Christian has drifted off, the promise of life will bring them back. And we remember what God has done for us. The promise from God helps us to turn off the snooze button. The promise of life will help us 
including the men who will serve us as elders. God has requirements for those who will be elders in the local church. We'll look at those. You may still have some questions after our next lesson about a month from now on this subject. If you do, see me and we'll, we'll look at the scripture together. But the scriptures have requirements. God has requirements for those who will serve. God's requirements are not limited to time. I mean, these requirements were not just for the first century. They're for the first 21st century. One thing that I would tell you, I've been doing a study in the book of John for a, a good while, over this last uh, eight months. And uh, we, we're going to look at this passage, God willing, again, maybe later this year. I mean, when I say passage, John 13. I hope to look at all of John since I've been working my way through John at some point. But one of the things that I see in John 13, and as you think about elders, is elders are to be towel servants for God and the people of God. Think about it. It's the last night of Jesus' life here on this earth. And what does he come up with? That he wants to lead his spiritual leaders? They are going to be apostles. These are spiritual leaders. There's application to all of us here, but, but I'm saying these are spiritual leaders. And what does he come up with? A towel. God wanted his elders, this, this, these are spiritual leaders, to be towel servants. He was. Just to review some things we've covered already in the other two lessons. Some essential duties of elder shepherds noted in our studies. They're to feed the flock, make sure the, shop, the flock is fed properly. They're to watch over the flock. They are tend to the spiritually sick. They're to keep their eye out for lost sheep, strange sheep. They're to be an example for sheep to follow. They know their sheep and their sheep know them. So they have to be with the sheep. To pray for the sheep. They has, must hold firmly. We'll talk more about this in our next study. Hold firmly to sound biblical teaching. Encourage others with sound teaching. And refute those, you know, you know, speak the truth in love, but refute those who oppose sound doctrine. Keep these things in mind as we consider men to serve here as elders. Because there is a sense of urgency for us as Christians to be away spiritually. We begin our journey in Christ by obeying the gospel and getting right with the Lord. We all need to develop passion and heart for the Lord because... He first loved us while we were still sinners, Romans 5. He has a passionate heart for us and He proved it by way of the cross. This morning, if you've not yet put your faith in Christ, you need to. Maybe you're struggling with your faith, and that's okay to struggle with your faith. Just don't give up struggling. But the Word of God is, will help you to be strong in the faith. Putting on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 will help you to be successful servants of God. But if you have not yet been baptized into Christ, we have opportunity this morning to, to obey the command of Jesus, to repent of sin, to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you can help you in a public way for any reason this morning, please come as we stand and sing.